Ever wonder what's hot in the baking world right now? It's not even that complicated. You get store-bought croissants, cut them open, shove in some store-bought cookie dough, and that's it. Hi everyone, I'm Gemma Stafford, professional chef, cookbook author, and creator of Bigger Bolder Baking. Welcome to Need to Know, your go-to podcast for everything baking entertainment. From the latest trends, this is the viral scrambled pancake trend. What? To the tips and tricks you crave. We discovered that if you take apple peels, toss them in a little cinnamon and sugar, and bake them for about an hour in the oven you get a really lovely treat plus exclusive interviews with baking pros hey it's liz from the sugar geek show thanks for having me Gemma. we've even got the bold baking hotline to answer all of your baking queries and questions is a dutch oven really necessary for baking bread and what difference does it make yes i think we probably would agree on that do we only yeah, oh good <laughs> <laughs> so join us every sunday for your new weekly baking ritual it's everything you need to know this episode is brought to you by Board Bia's Spirit of Ireland program. Please visit irishfoodanddrink.com slash spirit of Ireland to learn more about the rich history and renaissance of Irish spirits. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. This is What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights. I'm your host, Katie Kiever. Happy fall season. Hope you all had a great summer. I certainly know that I did. Um, we're back to talk about you. Yes, another apocalyptic another apocalyptic episode of What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights. Um, to that end, I have today Gail Hansen, who is a public health veterinary expert and independent consultant. She's the former state epidemiologist and state public health veterinarian for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And she has acted as a media spokesman, spokesperson on antibiotic stewardship and agriculture, which is how I know Gail, and an expert witness on animal welfare and zoonotic diseases. And that's what we're talking about today, because we're going to talk about avian flu, H1, uh, H5N1, uh, as it is known, um, but also as bird flu, which many most people know it by. So we we've had just to sort of set this up a little bit before I introduce before Gail weighs in. We've had many outbreaks of of outbreaks of bird flu in this country, um, but we are in the midst of possibly the worst one ever. Gail, I'm going to ask you to jump in on that. Um, I think this one is perhaps the biggest, is it not? Um, it's the one that's the most concerning to me. Um, and like you said, it's got this long name. It's HPAI for high path avian influenza, H5N1, clay 2.3.4.4B, genotype B3.13, bird flu. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's just call it bird flu, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but that gives you sort of the whole, it's whole genealogy, so to speak. And yeah, it's, we, we first saw this back in the winter of 2022 in birds in the United States. It's been around for a little longer in the world. And this one was different in a couple of ways. First of all, it made wild birds sick and killed them, as well as chickens and turkeys to begin with. It was just sort of uh -huh. in the bird population. Right. And it's really infectious among birds of lots and lots of different species. Um, but since it's hit the birds in the United States, and especially our poultry industry, we still haven't gotten a handle on it in poultry. So this was back in 2022. Right. So then it mutated so it could jump to other animals, including dairy cattle. And that's really unusual, especially right. coming into dairy cattle. It's like, well, dairy cattle don't get flu. Well, they do. They get this flu. That's what makes it so different. Right. So now it's found in lots of animals, um, you know, the, all kinds of birds, and birds are more than one species. It's found in dairy cattle, found in cats, bears, coyotes, skunks, seals, foxes. And then oh, wow. from... Yeah, so it's like a ton of different kind of mammals as well as birds. And then going from the poultry to dairy cows, it jumped species again, and it infected people in the United States starting this spring. And that's a first, am I right? That is a well, first. It's a first for this this one exactly, that we haven't seen the bird, you know, so this bird flu get into people. We've seen other kinds. Right. And people, of course, we have our own flu. We're coming into flu season. Um, but this is this is a bird flu, which we haven't seen in the United States before. Yeah. yeah. 
and in the human population. And in the human population, right? So We've certainly I, seen bird flu, but not, yeah, not in people like this. Yeah. I, I want to go back to something you said a minute ago, um, you know, sort of in terms of how many different species that it goes into. Um, you mentioned something about how the wild birds were dying. And I feel like I have read that frequently the host a uh, wild bird can carry the the virus, uh, another strain of bird flu, have often carry that virus without succumbing to it whilst they spread it to domesticated fowl like our chicken and turkey industries, and they do die from it. Have I misunderstood that? Or has it always been a killer of wild birds? Or has it often been that they are simply a benign carriers? You're exactly right. That the other bird flus that we've seen in the past We've sort of traditionally or conventionally thought of that as wild birds, especially ducks and geese that have been a carriers of it, but they didn't get sick from it. They were just right. the spreaders. And then it would get into our domestic birds, into our turkeys and our ducks and our, our chickens and make them sick. And, and when it's called HPAI or high path avian influenza, it means that it kills birds and kills our birds. This one is different because all of a sudden the ducks and waterfowl and, and swans and geese were getting sick and dying as right. well as passing it on. We're not seeing the good news, I guess, if there's any tiny piece of a sliver of a silver lining, <laughs> is that it doesn't seem to be affecting or even being carried by our songbirds. Oh, how fascinating. So I'll take that. Yes, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, it's right. a small one, but that's I'll I have that. a Merlin app on my phone. I love my <laughs> birds. <laughs> right. uh, um, I want to. I want to be clear about the numbers here because I think, um, you know, over the course of the summer, uh, reporting, I think from about March until I don't know July or August. Maybe I stopped paying attention at that point. Um, there were a number at like every day or every few days, you'd see that more. Uh, her dairy cattle had herds had been tested and found to be carrying this virus. Can you give us like some numbers, like some actual statistics? Uh, sort of. Okay. Um, so in birds and chicken and our domestic domestic poultry, so chickens and turkeys, it's in the millions. Right. So it's resulted in the death of over sixty million poultry. Not six, all the, zero? six zero six zero six six zero million. Oof. Right. Not all of those have been sick and died from that because if they find it in a flock of birds, they'll kill all the birds. The farmers and USDA kills all the birds because um, it may, it's likely to spread and will spread and, and make these birds sick and die. So right. 60 million birds, um, 197 herds of cattle. We don't know how many individual animals. USDA has not been very uh, forthcoming on that. Uh -huh. uh, the cattle seem to get sick mostly when they're producing milk. And we haven't looked at a lot of, we just haven't looked at a lot. I mean, that's one of the things USDA, and one of the things that, that sort of concerns me is that uh, the USDA could be working a lot more towards sort of really three major objectives. So to protect farm, the farm animals, including our dairy cattle, our other cattle, pigs, birds, protecting people and helping make changes so the agriculture is ultimately healthier and, and you know, sort of more, more, more sustainable. Robust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so in people, um, in people, there have been 14 cases that we know so far, and so far it's been a real mild disease. Okay. And most of the cases have had poultry or dairy cow contact. Right. Um, so that's the good news. Another, you know, I, I always try to find the silver lining. That's another tiny silver lining. That's been mild <laughs> cases. And then we've also seen it in 35 cats. And those really? that has not been good for the cats. It's been very severe, and a lot of those cats have died. Right. I think I read. I, is it? I think it's. I think it is. This um, variant of the bird flu has also infected domesticated or uh, farmed mink. Is that is that also true? I'm sorry um, to be like so vague about some of these things, but you know I've been following this for like a while now, and it's right. It's right. gone through a lot of mutations, really. It it has, and it, um, we it hasn't been reported in mink in the U.S., but I think that's because we haven't been looking for it. They found it um, in Finland and in Spain um, because they've been actively looking for disease and trying to figure out right. when the animals get sick, what's going on with it. And in Finland and Spain, when they found it, they said, we know that it sounds weird, but the mink respiratory system is a lot closer to ours than a lot of other animals. So if it's getting into the mink, it's easy more easy for it to get into people. Uh -huh. So they made the decision to get rid of all of those 
um, farms that had had mink and just like we're not going to take any chances. And the U.S. were not looking. Right. Even though we had such a big outbreak of COVID in the mink population. Right. 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 I mean, <laughs> yeah. the mink so population, I mean, that's a whole other thing. The mink population yeah. in the U.S. is the farmed mink, which is a weird thing because mink don't live together normally. Mm-hmm. We don't even know where those farms are, how many there are. They're one of the least regulated in mm-hmm. the industries. So yeah, right. we don't know what's going on with the mink here. Well, I'm hoping it's a dying industry because it just the whole idea just makes me kind of sick. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> not a fan. Like I said, it's a whole. It's a whole other. That's problem. another show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Um, so when we talk about when things are traveling from one, like, so I think the first thought I had when when I realized that it was jumping between species is, has it jumped into the hogs, you know, the pig species into pork? Um, onto pork farms because those there those animals are very closely related to the United States in terms of our physiology, right? Right, they're they're very close to to people. Um, their respiratory systems um, are fairly close to ours. Though once again, the, the mink and ferrets are even closer. Um, that's one of the sort of places where USDA really needs to up its game of, you know, looking for the short-term animal health issues, mm-hmm. looking for human health and ref- as well as reform. But we really haven't been looking very hard in our swine. So once again, if you don't look, you're not going to find it. Yeah. Um, they certainly do look for some swine um, influenza, but they're not, they're not looking proactively. I you know, see. So if they have so, animals that look sick, they may look, check them for it, but they're not looking proactively. So is it possible that um, the swine the swine are getting sick, like the cattle gets sick um, for a short period of time, then they seem to get better. And the reason they found it in dairy cattle is because the milk started looking funky is the best way to put it. Ew. Yeah, it looks Ew. Sick. And, yeah. <laughs> like nobody's drinking this milk. Right. Um, but... But then the animals would get, and they looked, then they were off for a few days and they would get better. Is that happening to pigs? Right. We're, when I say we, I'm saying USDA is not looking. They're not looking very hard at that. So I wish I could give you a good answer, but the answer is, I don't know. Right. Well, that's a good answer. Um, now, let's talk for a minute about the, because you mentioned earlier that in order to manage the disease within the poultry populations, all, you know, let me hasten to add, we're talking about, large, you know, barns full of poultry, right. um, you know, our, our industrialized poultry growing system. Um, when that is, when a herd or a flock is affected, don't they, ha- I mean, they are obligated, at least in the poultry industry, they're obligated to kill all of those birds, right? In the poultry industry, right. Um, that's both sort of federal and international, that if you've got um, this high, high path avian influence, what we're calling the bird flu, um, then all the birds have to be killed. And USDA has a system for that. Um, and they indemnify, they give money to the, the farmers who have lost their birds. and have That's to what have I them. wanted to ask was like, what happens to these guys? Because I know they live on the margins as it is, right? right? So they get paid. They get paid for their birds. They get paid for their birds and um, they get compensation because you can't just kill all the birds and then bring new birds in autom- you know, right away. You have to let it sort of sit there for a time, um, you know, and they, and they do kill. And like you said, they are big farms. So you've got, you know, 60,000 birds in a barn. Right. Um, cattle is a little bit different. So right now, um, because the animals don't get, for a, a number of reasons, but the animals don't, don't die. I mean, the, the um, poultry will get sick and be sick for a while and die and die an agonizing death. Oh. Um, cattle get sick, but um, they don't seem to die from it. They seem to get better. Huh. And they're also bigger animals, and there's really no USDA system to indemnify, nor do they have a big inclination to want to get rid of all the, um, all the cows on a dairy farm. And the dairy cattle industry is now big as well. So it's, you know, I, Oh yeah. You may be thinking of, you know, we've got a farm, we've got 50 or 60 animals, maybe no, 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 no. cattle. And now, <laughs> now we're talking about thousands. Yeah. Like 15,000 um, in right. a dairy herd. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Especially in like Wisconsin, you know, in the big Midwestern states where they have room for that kind of buildings. Yeah. Um, Texas and Florida and California mm-hmm. have some big ones. I mean, they're, they're big mm-hmm. everywhere. 
<laughs> yeah. And yeah. they're like big, big. Yeah, and frightening. Uh-oh. I mean, what about beef cattle? Is there is there a difference between the dairy cattle and the beef cattle in terms of their genetics that would make the dairy cattle more predisposed towards uh, acquiring bird flu? Or is it just you know, pure coincidence that somebody who was somehow affected. I don't know. I mean, how would it, how would that happen? Oh, once again, there's a lot of, you have a lot of good questions without a lot of good answers because we (laughs) haven't really been looking. Okay. The the way we found in dairy cattle, once again, like I said, the the big sign we had in dairy cattle is their milk looked bad. Right. Um, And dairy cattle, because they're milked a couple of times, two, three times a day, depending on the the farm. Right. um, And you're looking for, for changes in milk to make sure you're, you know. Of course, to uh, make sure it's wholesome. Make yeah. sure you've, yeah, it's, it's at least looks wholesome. Um, so you're going to find it right away. Beef cattle are raised, and, and a lot of those those dairy cows are indoors all the time. But like I said, they're looked at twice a day, every single day. Um, beef cattle, not so much. Right. Um, and if they look sick for a day or so, you may or may not recognize it and if they get better you're not going to recognize it and mm-hmm. once again usda you know we we sort of sort of going back to the same thing see three three things of uh of usda needs to really be looking at the short-term animal health and doing surveillance including on um our beef cattle which they're just beginning to look at a little bit uh-huh. but not being proactive and and that will affect our short-term sort of what i call short-term human health mm-hmm. um but you know, they're not looking at that, let alone looking at sort of the bigger, you know, that third third block, if you will, of, of really looking at reform of our our agricultural system. Well, so, I mean, <clears throat> that's a big question. We could spend a lot of time on it. But just to be brief, would you say, is it your testimony, Dr. Hansen, <laughs> is it your testimony that uh, part of why we see these massive outbreaks is, in fact, due to the way that we aggregate animals uh, very close together in one building or two, or whatever it is. Absolutely. I think, you know, we need to really decrease the CAFO confined animal feeding operation density and the size that the types of animals are all sort of, especially with birds, are all sort of one one type of bird. And so if, if you get a disease in there, uh, you don't have any genetic diversity. And so they, they're all going to die. But you really need to um, sort of replace USDA's sort of focus on, on just profiting agricultural co- corporations and more towards promoting a healthy and a sustainable food system. And right. So stopping this widespread loss of community, of rural values, you know, care for the land and, and sustainability and all that. So, so yeah, there's, um, th- there's a lot of things that, that, we really need to be doing to, you know, sort of step back and not only do we need to get a handle on the bird flu, but let's step back and, and figure out how do we keep, keep this from happening again, <laughs> because viruses right. are going to be coming back again. Yeah. If, it's, if it's not that, it may be something else. COVID. Right. Came, right. You know, it's like once you get it into, into the system, because of the way the system is set up, um, it's when you've got animals that close together and that many animals packed that tightly, yeah. once you get a disease in, man, it can spread like wildfire. Oh, sure. Yeah. The, the other thing with the, the, um, the dairy cattle is that the big farms and part of the, the issue that has happened with the bird flu is that the big farms are moving their cattle um, they're they're milking cows from one farm to another, and not like just across the road, but mm-hmm. from one state to another. So, um, cattle from dairy cattle from Texas were being shipped to, to Michigan. Oh, no kidding! Really? Yeah, that's really how a lot of it got spread around the country. Is um, dairy? You know, we've, they first saw it in dairy cattle in Texas and in Kansas, and now it's in fourteen different states. Right. Well, it didn't get there from individual birds. birds it got there because sick cattle were being shipped to different states or cattle just before they got sick were being you know before anybody noticed the milk was funky uh thick and yellow and and not looking right sounds like pus. shipped to to different uh to different farms mm-hmm. 
I didn't know they did that. I wasn't yeah. aware that dairy cattle were moved around like that. But okay. um, smaller dairy farms, it's very rare to happen. And, and dairy cattle that are in the middle of milking, mm -hmm. if you move them, they drop their production. So it, for a small farm, you know, or, you know, 100, 200 animal farm, right. um, it doesn't make any sense to do that. But if you've got thousands of, of dairy cows, it's um, it's a lot more common than I think most people outside of the industry would even imagine. Absolutely. Total supply to me. I never read about that anywhere. So thank you for sharing that particular detail. Um, we're going to have to take a short break. I'll be right back with Dr. Gail Hansen, uh, who is going to talk more about the USDA response to um, another potential pandemic, not to be too much of a fear monger, but that's kind of what we're looking at. So stay tuned for that. Hey, everybody. I'm Greg Benson. I'm Souther Teague. And this is Damon Bolte from The Speakeasy. And we're excited to share our latest episode with you, especially if you're passionate about the craft and culture of Irish spirits. This week, we had the pleasure of exploring the dynamic world of Irish spirits with three exceptional guests. Yeah, Andy Ferreira from Cask joined us to discuss the evolution of the modern Irish on-premise and mixology scene. We also spoke with Tim Hurley about the success of Lost Irish here in the United States. And finally, Dara Flanagan from Board Bia gave us some fascinating insights into what lies ahead for Irish spirits in the United States. Exactly. So if you are curious about the heritage and future of Irish spirits, this episode is for you. And to deepen your understanding, we totally recommend exploring the Spirit of Ireland program. Uh, it's really cool. It's a comprehensive look at the rich history and renaissance of Irish spirits, featuring interviews with master distillers, barrel coopers, and a lot more. It even offers a sensory journey through the barley fields and barrel houses of Ireland, which is super cool. Totally. So for those who want to dive deeper into the world of Irish spirits after listening to our latest episode, the Spirit of Ireland program offers an educational journey that goes way beyond the glass, taking you into the heart of Irish spirit making with stories, traditions, and a lot of innovations. Please visit irishfoodanddrink.com slash spirit of Ireland to learn more and find our latest episode wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. Okay, so before we talk about sort of this, you know, how zoonotic diseases um, proliferate and, you know, we saw co what COVID happened with COVID and now we may say something else with the bird flu. I want to talk a little bit about what happens if the bird flu really ramps up into other species, you know, dairy cattle, we've a given, maybe it goes into beef cattle. We don't know because we're not looking. Maybe it goes into pork. We don't know because we're not looking. What, what do you see as the economic implications or, or just the supply implications? Um, to our food system if we really see a massive outbreak of this flu in across multiple species. Yeah, um, it could have, some, obviously it could have some enormous implications, not only for the animals that either have to be culled, killed, because we saw that with, with, you know, chickens and turkeys, but also Absolutely. in our beef supply, potentially our pork supply, and affecting our um, export markets as well. Right. So not only the loss of, of animals so that our prices of, of poultry and beef and pork go up, but also loss of, of uh, potential export markets. Right. So that, this is a massive issue. Okay, so now let's really turn our attention to the USDA. What? So you've mentioned that, okay, they have mandatory culling for bird flu, uh, no mandatory nothing as far as I can. I mean, I went on the USDA page for blue bird flu. Right. And I did not see any mandatory testing guidelines for dairy products, for meat, 
or really any mandatory procedures besides culling poultry uh, to manage this disease? Like what, <laughs> what, what, what are they doing? It, it's pretty minimal. So there's a lot of recommendations and the USDA does have the power to regulate, but they've so far, they've just recommended things. What they, the only thing that they have done is that they require that if um, an animal is moved interstate, um, then, or if a herd is moved interstate, that you have to test those animals, or if you've got a whole herd, test at least 30 of those animals, uh -huh. um, if you're going from state to state, unless you're going directly to slaughter. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, Scratching my head on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah the only, why not poison this? <laughs> oh, right, right. And, <laughs> and, um, and at least 22 states have restrictions on importing dairy cattle from states that have already, the 14 states that they've already found it in. Um, the FSIS said they're going to start testing dairy cattle at slaughter a little bit soon, uh -huh. like the end of the beginning of next week. Okay. Um, but the, they're not requiring um, testing uh, milk. On, they've, there's a voluntary program, which has not been taken up very, very much. Uh, Colorado is a state that actually is requiring testing, but that's one state, and it's not the biggest wow. dairy state. Right. No, um, that would be like California, Wisconsin, and Texas. Connecticut. Right? Asking Connecticut to oh do something. Oh, my God, you know. really? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little bigger than Connecticut, but it's, you know, it's, it's just – you know, compared to Florida, California, New York, Wisconsin, it's it's nothing. Right. Uh, but but at least that's one state that said, yeah, we really are taking this seriously. Well, we don't have any approved vaccines right now for poultry, cattle, or people. Okay, that was uh, that's another question I was going to ask you. But before we go to that, what are the risks to uh, humans for in say a dairy cow? Because people should realize that when a dairy cow is spent, in other words, no longer produces or hundred weight of milk a day or whatever, it they go to hamburger. slaughter and it becomes hamburger. What are, are, Should we be worried that the flu would somehow, I don't know, affect uh, the, the uh, packing house, you know, slaughterhouse workers, or is there some risk to a human for consuming meat that has uh, come from an infected cow? I've never heard of that, but I'm willing yeah, to entertain it's, the it's idea. It's probably a bigger risk for the... Um for the, for the workers. workers at this point, they have found it in the meat of, of dairy cattle. And like I said, FSIS, USDA is going to start looking for um, uh, testing dairy cows at slaughter mm -hmm. um, beginning next week. But they don't have a plan. USDA has no long-term plan to test um, beef cattle and no nothing on, on, um, on, on swine. swine. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, you know, they do have some vaccines that they're looking at, but right. there's nothing approved. There's going to be nothing required. Um, Whereas in Europe, I mean, let's, let's, bird yeah. flu was obviously not confined to the United States. Right. What other countries are using vaccines in their poultry flocks, at least? Yeah, the, the biggest mm -hmm. one that I know of is, is France and, and they've been doing it in their duck population because that's a bigger industry for them. Okay. Um, the issue that, that they run into and that the U.S. would run into with vaccinating is the export of um, either live animals or even uh, the animal products, the, the, either the eggs or the, the meat itself, um, that some, co some countries, including the U.S., will not accept um, any products or live animals from places that, have, that do vaccination. Really? <laughs> Why does You're that make what, sense? What? <laughs> no, I, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, I understand, for example, there are countries that won't accept our uh, meat products because we use, um, for example, right. rectopamine. Right. Uh, and that's been banned in 168 or something countries. And yet the United States persists in using it. And so those countries do not accept it. And we, have, we actually have whole production lines that are uh, exempt from use of rectopamine so right. that we can export them. But, but I, I've never heard of anybody rejecting meat on the basis of vaccination. I, that is a new one to me. Yeah, that's that's true. For I mean, they, the same thing for foot and mouth disease, that um, there are countries that vaccinate against foot and mouth disease, but those yeah. countries can't import their meat to the U.S. If we started doing vaccinations for foot and mouth disease, we couldn't, I mean, it gets really weird. Not only could you not export um, meat to a lot of countries, but you can't export grain 
in the U.S. to other countries if you vaccinate for um, foot and mouth disease in the U.S. Oh my because God, you have, because there's a thing that says this grain or this product has come from a foot and mouth disease free country, and if you're giving vaccine vaccinations, you can't say that. And and it's kind of weird because I mean, the, no vaccine is 100 percent. Of course. Um, perfect. And I think that that's, that's been the excuse that's been given is that um, you can't tell a vaccinated animal from an animal that's had the disease sometimes. Um, there, uh-huh. it's, it's tough to do that. Um, and because it's not 100%, could you have animals that have been vaccinated but, but still break with the disease? Yeah, that happens with, I mean, that's, that's true for every single vaccine. So that's, to me, that's more of an excuse than a, a reason. But Absolutely. Yeah. And also <laughs> in this are. era of zoonotic diseases that are jumping from species to species, including humans, you would think that they that the trade partners would come together on some kind of a streamlined policy. <laughs> right? I mean, is that crazy to <laughs> I love that you're laughing. Yeah, well, yeah. It's like that that would that would presume that there was a lot of um goodwill and trust right among the different countries and that there was there were not any competing interests or self-interests that's I don't not know. reality <laughs> <laughs> right I, I don't know to me the self-interest in like first of all not having to you know pay farmers for birds that they've killed um yeah and wh- killed in ways that once again a whole other thing of how are they killing the birds of you know closing up the doors and windows and, and suffocating them is like yeah my favorite it's pretty way. gross yeah yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they just turn off the fans and shut the yeah doors, and right? then they cook them yeah then they're cooked mm-hmm. oh yeah. god <laughs> once again a whole other broadcast that other is another, who can, who that's can another talk show. about that better than i can yeah yeah well I, as of as of that i think you know what you're talking about <laughs> well what, let me ask you what are other countries doing that we could be doing okay we have the vaccines we are have, there other measures that the united states could emulate yeah, um, there's, from other there's countries? A, right. There are other countries, especially it's especially Europe and Australia, um, sort of the, what they call the higher income countries. Yeah. Um, they have increased surveillance. So they're looking proactively looking for bird flu and other diseases right. so that they can catch it before it becomes a problem. So they're instead of chasing after the train, they're getting in front of it and saying, whoa, stop. Right. And then when they find it, instead of saying, oh, we probably should do something about it, they're doing something about it. So you know, right. the, the, the mink in in Spain and Finland, they don't have a vaccine for it. Rather than saying, well, let's just sort of see how it plays out, which is pretty much what we did in the U.S. for COVID and mink. They're mm-hmm. saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to proactively keep animal health, animals healthy, keep the people healthy, and we're going to get rid of the all of these animals We're going to kill all of these animals so that we don't have a potential of it going into people or going into our other farm animals or going into our wildlife. Right. So we're not doing that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so what are, what is that? I mean, what, is that a political decision on the part of USDA? Are they succumbing to pressure from uh, these large industrial purlayers? That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it really does come down to, um, down to sort of the you know get big it, it really harkens back to that get bigger get out yeah thing right which is not sustainable you can't keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger that there comes a point where you can't get any bigger you you run out of place <laughs> right right uh, although we seem to and you know now that we have these methane digesters that everybody's so gassed up about yeah <laughs> <laughs> They're like, sure yeah. we can. We can get any really big now because we know what to do with the poop. You know? Right, right. But it was, I mean, it was it's sort of weird because the, the whole reason for the get bigger, get out was to, and to really displace small farmers was to defeat the Soviets back in the, you know, back mm-hmm. in the Cold War. Um, yeah, but you really wow. can't sustain agriculture, sustain the earth endlessly by expanding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, but really sort of a, and there, I mean, there really are some limits and danger to giving power to the politics over animal health and public health. Oh, I think we just saw that with COVID. I mean, yep. you know, we did not have a robust, you know, it took a while to get a robust response to that. Although in the end, we came out better than many other countries, I think. Right, right. But, you know, sort of and sort of going back to COVID, it's like everybody's pointing their fingers at what happened in China and, and them right. not being proactive and not getting a handle on it. Well, 
do right. we want to be that guy in that country for for bird flu? Right. Especially if it mutates yet again and becomes a more virulent strain of flu that affects human beings. Right, right. I, I mean, mean the, the, the good news is that um, most people, I don't want to say most of it, there, there's, there's some division there. So there are a lot of people who are saying that it, it won't be a problem. But the World Health Organization has said that since bird flu is constantly evolving, it could potentially become easily transmissible from person to person. Right. I mean, I, I think that's that's kind of like the ultimate, you know, that is the ultimate, um, I don't, well, it's the goal of the virus for sure. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, and not only that, but, but I think the other threat of a, a pandemic caused by sort of this human adapted flu strain, um, it hasn't yet acquired the ability to spread from person to person or cause what I call bad disease in people, which means that they die. Um, right. but as we come into regular flu season, um, it gives the virus, not only does it give the bird virus a chance to not only to mutate, but to reassort with the human flu. So it means that the human flu and the bird flu get together in one person I see. and they exchange genetic material. All of a sudden you have a brand new virus. Right, right. That's what I'm thinking. Well, I saw, I mean, to that uh, point, I saw that the CDC is preparing some 4.8 million doses of an antiviral which is engineered for this particular strain of of the bird flu, right? What what does that mean to you? Um, it it means that they're beginning to think about it, but really, you know, they they really need to increase efforts. And it's sort of a USDA uh, HHS kind of thing, you know. So CDC kind of thing that four million doses of of flu virus. Um, who gets it? Who doesn't? Mm. I mean, we've got, that's 4 million. How many people are there? <laughs> 330, um, right? Do you, yeah. Right. Do you give it to people who are working with the birds? Do you give it to people, you know, I certainly recommend everybody get their flu shot so you don't become that person who's the, you know, patient zero for the next pandemic. Right. Um, at least not from re, from the two viruses meeting together. Um, but, you know, it's, it's you know, 4. 4 million, 4.3 million doses Presuming the virus doesn't mutate enough so that all of a sudden this vaccine is no longer very effective. Right. And then as we found with COVID, you have to get people who take the, vi- take the vaccine. Well, yeah, that's another whole story, isn't it? I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, greater numbers of measles outbreaks in children because parents are eschewing uh, childhood vaccines. Yeah, um, I mean, the U.S. lost its, vac- its, its measles-free um, status because people, you know, they, they got concerned about one kind of vaccine. They, there was the loss of trust, once again, in the public health. And now people are not vaccinating their kids against diseases that, um, We're that once they've been eradicated. vaccinated against forever for for whooping cough, for measles, for rubella, you know, German measles, red measles, right. uh, mumps, uh, chicken pox. And we're seeing fewer and fewer people in the U.S. getting vaccinated. And there's no, um, at this point, mandating a vaccine politically isn't going to fly. No, it won't. It, it won't. Thanks again to the orange buffoon. Um <laughs> <laughs> and his and his revolting uh, bag of merry pranksters. I mean, honestly, the damage done to public oh, trust in yeah. uh, institutions in this country is is really kind of breathtaking. And it wasn't just John. I mean, RFK himself was also very instrumental in scaring people off of oh, childhood God. vaccines, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just been this perfect storm of morons who don't seem to understand how any of this stuff works, but they get a bully pulpit and they blurt this stuff out and people are like, oh, okay, because nobody bothers to educate themselves. I guess, you know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer, what did you have a, a prescription for how to, <laughs> <laughs> doctor, do you have a prescription <laughs> For how to inoculate people against stupid ideas. <laughs> I mean, if I had if I had an answer, I could be I could certainly retire by now. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And, you know, and, and I think it is going to be. It, it's real easy to get people to lose trust in um, public health or in government in general. It's incredibly difficult to 
to win back that trust. But I think that's one of the things where USDA could be doing a lot more. They could be doing a lot more to protect protect farmed animals. They could be doing a lot more to make changes to make agriculture healthier and more sustainable. They could be working with HHS and um, state organizations, state governments to um, help to protect people. So mm-hmm. we really need to be, you know, looking at what is what is USDA doing? How could they be doing more? But, you know, it, it sort of comes back to that duality of USDA, where they're supposed to be making sure that our food is healthy and sustainable, but they're also supposed to be promoting agriculture. And sometimes those two clash. Yes, absolutely. Well, as you observed, I mean, the, the reason that the USDA is dragging its feet on establishing any mandatory uh, regulations around testing and um, calling or whatever is because they're getting industry pressure to not do so. Right, and, and right. That, I mean, there's and, no upside for the for a dairy farmer. There's no upside. Mm-hmm, I mean, they right. may get a little money for the loss of milk. They're getting money for test. They do get money for testing. USDA is paying for testing and and the shipping and all the stuff that goes around testing. Um, but you still, all of a sudden, you've got this brand of your your farm of being a farm with bird flu on it. Right. And, and once again, do you want to be that farm? <laughs> right, right. Which, oh, yeah. I mean, I and I and who's who doesn't sympathize with that? I mean, of right. course, I don't yeah, really get yeah, that. Yeah, there, there's there's really no upside for for the farms to to want to to do that testing. It's all it's going to do is you know at best cause heartache and uh, you know and loss of of income, loss of the farm potentially to another big farm. Right. Um, and, you know, it's like I said, there's, there's no upside. And, and since the dairy cattle and probably beef cats, I can't believe it's not in beef cattle as well. Right. I mean, um, a cow is a cow, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, pretty I mean, much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if the animals get better, A, why would you vaccinate for something where you're going to get better in a few days anyway? Okay. And it's going to cost you money to do. Right. And if you know you're you're pretend, you're expecting that um you know you're going to get um going to get hit with the the virus and what if you don't then you feel like you've wasted the money sure you know, sort of like getting but it's sort of like getting insurance on your car it's like you hope you never get you're getting it in case you have an accident you hope you never do sure and that's sort of what vaccines are like to me it's like you hope you never get it but if you do you you know you're, you're sort you of have covered. some protection right 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 but you know is it you know, and, and for chickens, especially a little less so for turkeys, but for chickens with 42 days, it's a lot cheaper to get rid of all those birds, start again, especially if you're getting paid for all those birds. Right, right. Why would you, why would you spend an extra amount of money, whether it's even if it's pennies, um, to vaccinate every single bird when if you lose the birds, government's going to reimburse Who cares? Them. Right. You're, yeah, you're made whole anyway. So, and you just, and the, and the integrator just ships you another load of birds after you disinfect your barns. Right. I mean, in a way, I understand how simple that is. That makes sense. It's just to go back to the whole point of this conversation is that this particular pathogen is now if infecting human beings. And so, right. as you described earlier, you know, that, that virus can butt up against the human flu virus and create a whole new beautiful marriage made in virus heaven yeah. in which you know or millions and millions right. <laughs> right millions of people get it yep. and then what you know so right. very interesting i guess we should leave it there um but gail i thank you so much for this we didn't get to talk about antibiotic resistance which <laughs> i would you want to come back and talk about that because that's been a favorite topic of mine and um, over the years, I have covered, I've gone back again and again and again to that. And I feel like when I interviewed you probably 10, 12 years ago, this is my 15th year of doing this show. Um, you know, I don't feel that there has been any measurable change in how we use antibiotics in our food system. Do you? I think there's there's been a little bit of a change, but not enough to, to make a difference in, in exactly what we were con- concerned about 10, 15 years ago has, has happened is that yeah. FDA said, okay, you can't use it for growth promotion, but you can still use it for so-called prevention when you don't have disease there anyway. <laughs> um, I get using it for control. If you have it in a flock or in a herd, you want to make sure you don't, it doesn't 
go through that spread. Going, sure. but that sort of goes back to the reforming the whole system. Right. Um, right. But well, that's that's our next conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thank you so much for joining me. Is there uh, is there a place where people can go to learn more about your work or? As, as we discussed, your website is not quite um, yeah, my, open my, for my public consumption is, at this moment. Yeah, my my but, website is a dead dead thing. I would recommend going to either the Farm Forward website or KAW, which is Keep Antibiotics Working. You know, talking about antibiotic resistance, right? Um, websites those um, those those two websites um, have a lot of information. Keep Antibiotics Working as a whole coalition of groups. And so you can look at who some of those other groups are and, and, and look to see what they, they're doing and what they've got. So I'd recommend those because, like I said, my, my website is a dead thing right now. <laughs> yes, right. And it's a sad thing, but it's true. Anyway, yeah. Gail, thank you so, so much for, enjoy, sure. for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you'll come back. Thanks, as always, to my sponsor for uh, supporting this show and this radio station. Uh, see you next week, folks. Have a good one. So long for now. What Doesn't Kill You, Food Industry Insights, is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.